Tonight will be Alberto Bertoli. We're having two this evening. This will be the, the final evening of our Introduction to New Faculty series, and it will be Alberto Bertoli and Phyllis Berkby. And uh, they tossed a coin, and Alberto's going first, or something like that. Um, Alberto was born in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, and he attended the Universidad de Buenos Aires. OK, who said that? <laughs> oh, Marie, I'm sorry. OK. Um, did you hear that Alberto was born in Buenos Aires and attended the university there, Universidad de, de Buenos Aires, and also went to um, uh, the University, Cal State um, Polytechnic University at uh, San Luis Obispo? And um, has entered several international competitions, one of which um, he won with his uh, design team. Uh, they won first prize in the uh, international uh, competition uh, in, uh, for students in Bulgaria. And it was a French-sponsored uh, competition at that time. Um, he has worked for Gruen Associates uh, with Cesar Pelli and uh, most recently with uh, Daniel Mann Johnson Mendenhall uh, with Tony Lumsden. And uh, here at SciArc, he's teaching fifth year with Tony as well. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Alberto Bertoli. <laughs> Maybe you should put this on too. So yes. It's really easy. You can just relax. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, I think uh, I was asked to do some uh, presentation on, on some of uh, my work, and um, it's going to be rather short, based on personal experience. Every time I went to a lecture, which was more than 10 minutes, I fell asleep. So it will be more than 10 minutes, yet, but, uh, but sure, in context, so maybe we can get the message across. Maybe we should start with the slides. Uh, This, um, the intention that I have tonight is, uh, is to show an effort that um, I have done with a very good friend of mine. He's from Mexico City. His name is Guillermo Riscorreta, and I'm sure you will hear of him later on. And, um, and I'm trying to illustrate um, the relationship between process and product. So basically, I think this evening will be dedicated to the students of, uh, in our studio, because we'll be touching some of the issues that we daily discuss. The, the whole thing started when, uh, when uh, not before that. I, I will be showing the whole presentation will be divided, let's say, there are two, it's one project divided in two parts. And uh, the first part, I will make an emphasis on um, arriving at a solution through the use of uh, models. And I know that that is very familiar with the school. The, most of the students tell me that uh, here at SciArc they place great emphasis on models. And the second one, the second part, is, uh, is an emphasis on another kind of process. It's not so much on three-dimensional, but in two-dimensional, with a series of uh, sketches and uh, sort of uh, ideas to put down in order to write to the solution. So both of them apply to what we are talking every day in class. The whole thing started in about, uh, it was in 1972, and the date is important because of the subject matter of the project. It, the title was, uh, we had to design a um, 
facilities for um, recreational facilities. And uh, the group and the program had to be defined, and the only thing we had was, uh, was the title of it, a Space for Recreational Facilities. Uh, the place, the, it was left open, but uh, in a way we decided for an area in the, in the north part of California, because we felt that at that particular moment, there were certain issues going on. In, uh, there was the end of the 60s. Uh, there was very strong social issues in America. And the uh, Bay Area somehow was a focal point for those issues, particularly certain cultural groups, which fit perfectly well with the intentions and the goals that we define in our project. <clears throat> So I, I have shown this map because it will be, I guess, everybody's familiar with the Bay Area, and uh, specifically Tiburon is located on the north side of uh, San Francisco, across the bay. And this map right here on the right side, uh, it will be interesting if you can keep it in mind, because uh, you will refer, it will be much easier for you to relate to the project. <clears throat> the part that it was developed, it goes um, I mean, uh, San Francisco is here, down the picture. And uh, the part that it was developed is this area right here, a connection. And what is right here on the right side is Angel Island. And Angel Island is an empty piece of land right now. And uh, it suits perfectly well our purposes. One of the first things that we had to do was define the, the group of, uh, of users for this particular project. We had to define them. Uh, we had to define leisure. We had to define recreation, what it meant for us. Um, we had to find out about the area. OK, well, maybe the easiest thing is just to start with the area. We went um, and looked through that tiburon, particularly because of its relationship to Angel Island. And maybe just uh, there is some, as you can see, there are a series of shops and waterfront, um, some small type of construction with the uh, hills in the back. It's, uh, it's a rather unsophisticated uh, development. Uh, there is some nice sort of human feelings as you walk through. Uh, cafes, uh, relationship of uh, water to main use, um, some use of, uh, I guess, tourist uh, attractions. Um, in general, the scale of the place start talking of, uh, of an area where perhaps depends more of the user, but uh, it can serve as a uh, framework for, in order to develop certain ideas. There are old uh, piers in a way abandoned. Um, Okay, well, that's the, that's the place, that's the setting, that's the stage. The second then we had to develop was um, our definitions. And, uh, and that was an important task because how would you define um, uh, recreation or how would you define uh, leisure? Well, we decided, we made, at that particular moment, we thought, or the way it is expressed even today, uh, we took it as saying that there is an interaction cycle. And the cycle, perhaps we can say that men in the, 
in normal times, or as we are, as we perform, we can divide it. There are certain hours that we sleep, and there are certain hours that we participate. And we thought that maybe we can say we participate in a mechanized way, or we participate in a creative way, in any event, that, um, in any daily event. However, for leisure to occur, we thought that if in the normal case, when a person goes and work and uh, performs certain mechanized participation, he's asked to do certain things. The, uh, the re part of the remaining cycle, he is doing his um, creative participation. It could be at home, it could be some, some other place. And the remaining is just sleeping. In another case, it could be that the creative participation starts overlapping the, um, the mechanized one, where maybe there is some personal input on the activity that the person does. And that starts telling us that perhaps if we can say, with the exception of this one, we can integrate these two areas, we may, get, we may reach the place where the um, the man in his performance, in his daily performance, could intensify the, by the overlapping of the mechanized with the creative, may intensify his life, and even with the hopes that that lifestyle may affect his dreams and having some, instead of nightmares, pleasant dreams. So we call that the, the existing and what we were proposing, the emerging. And it relates very much to the area where we were doing our project because of there was a certain particular cultural group that were questioning these social issues were coming up and somehow they were trying to integrate themselves with uh, society. Then we tried to say, well, is there any kind of group that perhaps fits into this category very strongly today? And another event happened at that time. I don't know if you recall that there was the, um, when the American Indians part of the American Indians, they tried to uh, move into Alcatraz, and uh, it was a whole issue about that. But nevertheless, it gave us the, the insight that perhaps one of the groups in history, and that is this everywhere, that they may have more of this lower part of the cycle is the, uh, the real Indians. I mean, they had to perform their life, and they had to do certain uh, uh, performance just for surviving, but at the same time, what they were doing, they were doing it personally. They were doing it at their own pace. They were doing it with certain kind of a system. And that was very close to what we, to our aim, to our goal. So we decided to take the, the American Indians as the, our cultural group in order to develop a play for, place for leisure. At the same time, we were trying to develop uh, some other definitions. Uh, I'm going to be sort of short, so brief, so we can um, explain our, our ideas. Uh, the notion of uh, introverted and extroverted streets that in, 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 in general, this has to be seen in its totality. In general, leads, it was leading us to uh, what we were saying, what is the gener generator of, uh, of activity. And spontaneity was for us a very important issue. It's not that just men will have to perform in his uh, mechanized environment in a more creative way, but it has to be, in a, a, a spontaneity was an important ingredient because it has to happen a certain moment. The moment it is planned is not spontaneous anymore and perhaps creativity may drop. Uh, therefore, is instead of having, let's say, areas, physical areas in the city where you can have certain performances and you go out in the street and you do certain kind of activities here, you come out, there's another one here, another one there, another one there, we thought that perhaps if it is as, uh, which is existing, if we can have a place where we can have as a continuous. In other words, that lower part of the cycle may start taking place in a physical form. Where I go to the street and at all moments there are certain uh, way of expressing my creativity, participating, and the leisure will introduce itself into my life. Well, it will happen at, uh, at uh, different degrees, of course. It will not be intense all the way, but at different degrees. Okay, based on those um, 
based on those notions is that came the first part of our project. And um, there were some other steps, but it's, I mean, I think these are the basic notions that, that we can discuss tonight. From here, we, ta we took off and we tried to develop the project in a three-dimensional way. So just remember that map that uh, we saw at the beginning so you can associate the, the project. Another analysis that we tried to make uh, that moment was <clears throat> what makes uh, public and um, private domains and um, the, we took some examples first on, um, on buildings, houses. Uh, there's a house done by me and uh, we analyzed and we find out that, for example, uh, common courts, although it's very usually often used, uh, what it does is uh, reduces privacy and there are some acoustical problems. Everybody's sharing the same court. There are certain dining areas over here where they are completely away from the public areas. It is some kind of uh, a contradiction in that organization. <clears throat> there is some other typical house over here. Um, the outdoor spaces conflicts with several functions. And um, again, there is no sense of privacy. Um, there is uh, the territories within the house um, sort of uh, flow or they are not clearly defined except for, for certain walls, but uh, is, you really, it's like clustering yourself into a cell in order to get to your own territory. It's not done in a natural, it doesn't come in a natural way. In another development, uh, another typical California, again, the, the courthouses uh, completely uh, relate in, they start relating a bit more into what it could be more private than in the Mies uh, example, um, but yet uh, um, there is no clear definition between the domains within the house. Um, in another house, this is one proposed by Alexander, which by the way, there was somehow we, that's the approach we decided to follow at the beginning. And the main reason for that is that um, uh, two, maybe four years before that, they had entered a competition for, uh, in Peru for low income housing. And when we read through the entries, it was still, it was there and uh, some of the Japanese guys were there. When we saw his entry, we felt extremely good. And perhaps it's because we relate to that type of culture. And what we felt good was that he was able to grasp the essence of the project, of the problem. And he somehow, he expresses, I guess you are familiar with uh, his process. He doesn't want to call it method. And uh, so we decided to use it as a guideline. And uh, this is one of his proposals in his house. Uh, there is a clear division. He divides what is adult family and children's domain, and each one will have his own courtyard. So there is a definition of territoriality. There is a definition of privacy. And there is a sense of uh, direction in the whole house. <clears throat> it's just searching for, um, as I said, uh, uh, what is private and what is public and domains and interlocks and all those kind of notions that may affect the, uh, an organization. Then we analyze, we will change the scale, we analyze some part of the city where um, in a row development, all the houses are the same, uh, all the street is the same, there is no sense of place, everybody relates to the same street and or to the back. And uh, in, this, in this urban, or, or sort of cluster, there is a main street uh, and everybody, this is a major street, everybody fits into secondary ones and each house will relate in a more sort of neighborhood form where it's not only that your own domain inside the house but perhaps this street or this part of the street becomes yours and then there is a relationship between the street and the corner and the next group. It seems to be a bit more uh, uh, human in its organization.
two more clusters with the typical uh, garden city on the right and the garden city on the left. Uh, we can see that the car is introduced on the back. This is one of the funniest things ever done. The car comes from the back right here. You enter the house through here, yet this is supposed to be the front of the house. So you always come to your house from the back. You never come from the front, but that's the front of the house. And, and this one in this cluster organization is very interesting, except that this part over here, the central part of the thing is, is the parking lot. It's a very interesting notion just to develop a parking lot as, a, as the form giver of your living spaces. <clears throat> Besides, also, they collect the garbage right there. So. Anyway, so based on those um, <clears throat> sort of definitions and, and research or findings, we started developing the project in a three-dimensional form. <clears throat> So you're going to see now a sequence where it, um, we went from the very general to the very specific. If you recall in the map, this, uh, that will be the organization of the place. On the right side, on the left side is the island. And on the right side will be the mainland and a connection in between. And here, the notion is to take all kind of uh, possible symbols uh, in a certain, certain, some of them in the general, uh, in the general term, in general terms, they are done with shapes already given to you, but they, they could be meaningful. And then you start organizing the place within certain scale. You start organizing the place according to certain specific functions. You know that over here, we said, uh, well, we, since, since the Indians relate to the land, and since this island is completely open, that could be a place that they could have uh, their territory. Uh, they don't need to take Alcatraz. They can have the island. They can cultivate the island. They can have their dwellings. But yet, we need to give them a connection to the existing in order to integrate the both, because that was very important. And on the right side, it will be a community that could relate to them. And in between, it will be that kind of a leisure that we thought it could create sort of a, 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 um, a leisure corridor. We call it the leisure spine at that time. And all kind of functions that, as you go from the right to the left, it may relate more to this, um, um, to our traditional cultures. And as you get to the left, it may relate more to the Indian cultures. There's some examples on the right side where it could be in an orthogonal shape uh, organization. And as you approach the, that bridge, the beginnings, there are some activities like perhaps certain hotels or motels where these people can earn their living. It was fundamental in our notion that uh, the people who would use these facilities would have to build it themselves. Is uh, another shot to this uh, bridge in between. This, uh, as you go up, they could include certain um, sport facilities on the right side. On the left side, the sports will become the fishing, fishing for themselves, for their survival. And it will be some uh, kind of uh, an open, open theaters with some other kind of cultural facilities adjacent to the housing, and as you come over here, maybe some shops that could start relating between the two. It's this kind of relationship rather than this. You let the shapes of the elements that you use dictate certain things, which, you know, in reality, I mean, this, this could become a marina, it's possible. If there's already certain shapes that are given for certain specific things. But if not, this could become uh, some series of, uh, of shops, I don't know. Whatever it could be at that particular moment. But it gives you, start giving you scale. Start giving, you don't go beyond certain scale that you feel is, uh, is appropriate. It's a way to come to start coming into the project in a more intense way, um, always from the general into the specific. This 
introduction of color, it, it means something, it means uh, circulation. Usually we decided to use orange as circulation, so whatever you see orange, it could be circulation or open public spaces. And finally, we reach the other end, where we say this is the area where the, where the Indians are going to have their own dwellings. And um, this will be a series of groups, as we said. This is a series of a group of uh, dwellings, which, according to their family structure, is not just one unit, but there are several units interlock. So the next step was, OK, let's stop on this kind of model at this level, and let's jump to another one. Let's maybe take a group of those and see what we can do with it. Again, on, on an ast always in an abstract fashion, but playing with symbols. And we say, well, maybe we do have an area where we have three or four units, and each unit, we call them clans that relate to their culture, and uh, each clan may have four or five uh, houses. And then what happened when we group them together? OK, there is some circulation in between. This could be the cluster. There is some connection. There is some, the symbols of uh, saying there is an interaction between the two. There are some green spaces that uh, could happen at different levels. Then it came the notion that uh, in their culture, they really travel through the roofs. and. Uh, we may not do it. For us, the roofs is something to protect us for the weather, but for them, it's a usable space. And therefore, something is going to happen at those levels. Something is going to happen there, and something is going to happen at the, at the street uh, level. Uh, the scale over here, which is different from the previous model, it starts getting more into the specific, yet there is uh, lots of uh, abstraction in it. As you can see, you can develop some, a very deep interest on what you're doing to, uh, in developing your project. You are not, you're not a specific yet by all kind of uh, traditional standards, but you, are, you can get to it in, an, in absolutely no time. Finally, we decided with uh, the previous model, that was the end. That was as far as we could get. We couldn't get any more information than that, so we had to jump again scales, and now perhaps come to specifically the dwelling. And uh, in order to do that, then we had to get uh, more specific, and we developed some kind of a structural system. We said um, these particular people, they should come to a place and they build their own uh, facilities, but they cannot build it totally uh, free on any on any form that they want, they will have to, as they do, respect certain rules. And we thought that the rules could be given by certain structural elements. And these structural elements were nothing but interlocking beams. And it will have all kind of a system where the house and the unit within certain grid, that the unit could be attached to it. It was just connected at one of these points, and a room could be developed in between. And on the lower portion, utilities and all kind of uh, infrastructure could be developed. So now here we are getting to a very clear um, scale of the project and uh, introduce some figures just to give, to not, not to go beyond what you're trying to do. And uh, here could be the connection between two houses. And uh, as we said before, there's some use of the roofs. Units could be connected between themselves. It could be that that over there is one family, and this is the same family. Actually, that's the way it works in their culture. And it's just represented by, at this level, at this moment, 
are represented by two circles, circles having the symbol of uh, total interaction. And um, we didn't know what kind of physically we would, how we would connect them, but at this point we stated, and we knew that that, that was going to be there. The separation was that um, <clears throat> the, the sleeping facilities would occur at the lower level, then they start talking about the issues of private and public domain, as we analyzed previously, and the public areas will be on the top, which relates to the roofs. They actually, they go from family to family, they just walk through the roofs. I didn't know very well, we didn't know at that time very well how it, uh, it would be done, but it's stated, in the model it is stated. And so we arrived to a level where we said, <clears throat> well, here's our solution. The next step will be perhaps to do another model where it's a traditional one, and we start showing the windows, doors, and exactly the right scale. So in this particular moment is where we question ourselves very strongly, because um, we said, well, we were supposed to design something for leisure, for recreational performances of a certain group. And here we're dealing with a group of people who are very rich in their cultural values, but yet uh, we don't know much about them. It's, it seems that we shouldn't be acting with this group. We felt immediate, at that particular moment, after going through all this, we felt very uncomfortable. So we thought that if perhaps we take a group that is closer to our own, we will be much in a much better we will have the opportunity to produce something that was more significant. So what we did, we started again from, from not actually from zero because we had some information, but we deeply started analyzing the project that it should be done. And as you recall in the site plan, there were those two groups. We said the, Indi the Indians in one side and our uh, sort of culture in the other, in the other end. And in the group that it was at that time in San Francisco, uh, or in the, San, in the Bay Area, was responding to our criteria, was responding to what we needed. They were, um, they were really interested in a more intense participation in the daily life. So what we did in order, first of all, is attack the planning, and we said we made some analysis of personal experience that we had. And uh, we analyzed, for example, certain existing organization, this one happens to be in Buenos Aires, where it is very intense. There is a street where it is very intense the activity, where uh, today is a mall. At one time it was not a mall, but yet it was still very intense. The street was closed, and all kind of shops and business would happen all around it. And it would happen at all times throughout the 24 hours. And the notion of the 24 hours, the notion that always open, started to grow on us. And, uh, and these this were analysis based on personal experiences. Then we took um, the group, the group that he had to, obviously the group that was going to be built for, he had to tremendously participate on, uh, on the building of, uh, of their own space. And, uh, it fit perfectly well the, the area and Okay, well, once uh, we defined that, then the next step was just to develop the program. And we thought we don't need, when we did the models at that time, we didn't have enough information about our program. So it, it was, yet it was a great exercise to do it and to arrive to a solution, but it was incomplete. We couldn't support any of the ideas that we had said. So in following this um, organization or this process that Alexander has um, is just try to develop some form of a language by which you can apply findings at all scale, at scale of the city, at scale of the unit, into your project. And we would just analyze things that are common, that perhaps everybody could be very familiar. Um, 
anybody will probably know when you say building through fare, there is a certain, certain uh, kind of a continuity between spaces that it, it doesn't have to happen through the street, it could happen inside the building. And yet you are, because there are certain uh, functions, certain activities that happen there. I mean, street, street is, uh, is a framework that supports your activity activity well is a thing that uh, should happen it should not be uh, organized to the detail of what is going to be in that street but the street is a framework that supports your activity and therefore it will take the form it will take the shape that or it will take the the function that um, that it wants to be at that particular moment uh, it could be that one of those is it's just a market it's an open market that somebody comes and sells their product again relates to the to the cult, depends on the cultural group that is going to be uh, using this, uh, these facilities. The old notion of, uh, of gateways uh, today um, practically has been lost in certain kind of, uh, in time, at, at one moment there were a clear identification when you would enter a neighborhood. It could be either a building or just a post or something, but today we don't even have it. We move from neighborhood to neighborhood without even knowing it. Related to the other one, there are some shapes that perhaps distinguishes the particular building that you are coming into. Is, uh, there are also some social groups that, um, for some reason, they just uh, want to perform certain functions at certain times. So in the framework, the physical framework should support those things. Should relate to the type of uh, the cultural individuals that are at that moment, uh, in that particular neighborhood, it should take, it should influence the physical uh, expression of the building themselves. Uh, important elements as the stairs or balconies or should be uh, integrated with with the street. And here's where we camped and we said, well, I think we have enough. This, we, we develop much, many more than that. This is enough to illustrate the point. Uh, but that is where, at that particular moment, is when we went back to our original uh, investigation of, uh, of the continuity of, uh, of a place, of a street, that it perhaps will reinforce our notion of, uh, of leisure. It not happen in spots, but it happens in a continued form. And uh, here is where we stated, at this moment is where we stated that uh, for us, the leisure um, is what we called the leisure spine, that we would have to be developed in its totality. And that it was very important to have the relationship between the whole and the different parts. So what we developed physically, now we're on the other side, we are not any longer in Angel Island, we're on the mainland, and is still on the same side, and we said we will provide. We stop working for the Indians, we work on the people that we can relate, we understand much better, but we provide a connection. Eventually, it's going to happen some connection between our area and, and the island. So the notion of the spine all along the coast of uh, the corridor, it just started to grow from a series of uh, sketches where we knew that it was important to have the whole, but it was also very fundamental that the whole had to depend totally on its parts. And each one will have its own, um, its own function, its own responsibility to make the whole uh, working. Uh, we started zoning, this, and the previous one was done on a model, this is on a graphic form. We started zoning that kind of a corridor uh, by defining certain areas. Well, the back of it, the front is the water, so uh, in the back is the road, there is an existing road. It's very narrow, the whole space is very narrow, and it could be that the front could become intimate. I mean, you can go to the water and uh, is, you cannot go anything beyond that. So it could be certain spaces that are intimate. But the back is just nothing but the service. And the center between the two is what it could be the communal spaces. That's what everybody needs. That's the famous, uh, our famous corridor, famous 
leisure spine. We increased our uh, our investigation, and uh, we start getting a bit more precise as far, precise as far as drawing. We introduce the road where it is, and uh, still things are on a relative scale. Um, and introduce the notion. We definitely introduced the notion of housing, of housing that it could happen at different uh, levels. One is in, on one side of the street and the other one on, on our corridor. Those will be two type of uh, users. Um, we change the scale once more and we come closer to start defining our space. Uh, then here is where the spine or the corridor starts taking start taking certain shape at certain specific uh, functions and certain specific uh, areas. Here's where we treat the whole and its parts. And there. Things start getting clearer yet. We put to start defining what these areas could be. This is the connection that the, we had at the beginning. The island will be on the right side. Uh, we stop it right there. We know that this is going to be the bridge sometime, but we don't develop any further than that. Start taking some uh, cross sections and We still don't know what it happens in this area, but uh, we get a feeling there is certain height, there is certain activities happening, there is certain uh, uh, hoping for certain events that are in large scale, some events that are in small scale, some events that are individual scales. And then the notion, once we have the whole under control, then events that are in large scale, some events that are in small scale, some events that are individual scales. And then the notion, once we have the whole under control, then we want to develop uh, their parts. Some more sections on, on the other direction, the relation, showing the relationship of the hills with the water. And, um, The whole place, we call it kinetic because the notion of spontaneity and the notion of, uh, of, of, uh, of whole part relationship makes the place we hope, the place would make in a dynamic way. It's not a static, it relates back to our cycle, our definition, our life cycle. A diagrammatic section, yeah, the, which sort of a zoning the, the project in the different parts, not as, I would say, as clear, clear for us because we understood what these symbols mean and actually they start getting to be on scale. But that was also on scale, but it defines the relationship of the different elements of the site in relation to the water, in relation to the skies, in relation to each other and at what, and at what level they happen. Okay, then, um, <clears throat> fine, all that information had to take certain, certain shapes, certain organization, and this is the way it happened. That's the connection with the island up in, on the top. <clears throat> this is the existing of Tiburon here. That would be one of the generators. Our two points, or the, the two ends that we hope will be filled with all kind of uh, activities. It we didn't have the other end. The other end for us were this Indian culture. But we hope that the beginning of the bridge with certain kind of uh, activities like maybe fishing or something like that related to existing housing will create that kind of an ending that we, we needed. And the other one, it existed. Well, those shops that we saw at the beginning. The way this place we hope to grow, it will be if there is the location of, uh, we needed, besides this existing one here, the shops, we needed something else. We thought that we needed perhaps the office. I mean, the, it could be the architect's office. And that's how it, the place starts to grow. Um, 
materials come, people come, and the office is the first building to be built in this, and we are moving towards the existing and towards the future. And with time, there is more growth, there is certain other components that start to happen. Uh, if that's the office, maybe we can open a branch of the office, which is, could be maybe a block away, and that, that keeps this kind of an animal or kind of organism growing. And this is the hall. That's the way we hope the place will operate with the street for service and with the internal street for leisure. And the hall will have to respond to the organization of certain parts. And uh, the parts were developed into two levels. One that we call um, the corner. So it will be several corners. Everything is, is a block dot. And the corner connectors, which what happens in between. That means there is a hierarchical order of uh, organizing the site. Uh, the, the connection of saying I have an existing and I have a semi-existing points hoping to connect happens on another level within our complex. This is the corner, that's the other corner, and eventually something will happen in between. And once the, the planning of it uh, was stated, the whole organization was stated, we developed one of those parts. We thought that it was important not to develop physically the whole site, but to develop physically one of those components, when the ones that is one of those first parts that are going to start generating this uh, planning. And that's the way we started. We took uh, the shape and we said in the first level, there will be, it has to be a continuously with this notion of, uh, of uh, juxtaposition and overlapping of functions. It had to be a series of, uh, of spaces, a series of frameworks that allows uh, the people to uh, operate, to operate in a, and to give them some form, some sort of a framework where they can operate in a spontaneous way. Some things could be organized, uh, physically organized. We thought in the lower level, perhaps having an open stage, which is there open, there are some programs organized, but sometimes the people will come and maybe start playing at a certain moment. And physically took this form. Is, um, If this is the corner and that's the water and that's the street here in the back, <coughs> this is our stage, which could have the whole environment could have two levels. And um, in the lower level, in, I'm sorry, in the lower level right here, they will have all this stage and with all series of shops, uh, shops that relate to a more with the intention of uh, generating kind of uh, activities, spontaneous activities. There's a, the music shop, there is the, the arts, the flower shop somewhere, uh, the magazine, there's places where people congregate, uh, cafes, an open cafe which relate to the open stage. And this being the stair becomes a place, as we said it at one point, and it could be open. When you're up there, it could be open, so as you in, are in the cafe, you can enjoy some of the activities and participate. And above, there is certain type of housing, which will cross the street and go to the other type of housing. Uh, maybe housing for, in this case, maybe the people who work here or who, who want to participate much more intensively of what is going on here versus the other housing, which is a more quiet and, uh, zone, and relating again to this notion of domain, private, public. Some of all the shops that, that relate to the different, at the different levels to that corner. 
Here is just a statement of what uh, we did with the car. In the car pedestrian symbiosis, we thought that it was important not to drop the car, which is, uh, we, f we felt that it was it's a mistake. The car is an element that it is with us. But to subordinate the car to the pedestrian, not by putting it in another level or completely eliminating it, but by reducing the size of the street. Therefore, the car is not a high-speed car anymore. You just go there in order to provide service. But every time there's an intersection, the car, in, in a section, the car will have to go up, the pedestrian crosses, and then the car will go down. More or less, it took about that shape uh, or form, just showing all the different activities happening uh, at the different levels. Yeah, physically, uh, perhaps it's just uh, since the people who will be there is the ones who will they will take the an expression according to the, the rules stated, let's say, in our case by us, where there is a framework, there is a structure where everything should be attached to, but what happens in between, it will be left to the particular moment, it will be developed between the user and the architect, but it could take certain shapes uh, like that. Certain, those are the stairs, as we see in the middle of the corner, and it could be related to an open market that relates to the water. That's where uh, certain goods could be delivered during certain hours of the day. And then uh, in some other hours of the day, some other functions could, could go. But the, the framework just uh, supports that notion. Here's a clear one. There's a housing on the top. And this is all the galleria up above. And this is all the, the stair becomes a place for this stage. There's the notion that I will illustrate about the car. The car goes up, the pedestrian cross, and then the car goes down in a very narrow, just one car at a time. So we hope that those, um, that analysis, that it will bring uh, the participation of the, of the users, it will bring an intense participation of them, um, it could create spaces that um, relate to themselves as, uh, as individuals, and since, since they will participate in the creation of the part and the whole, the, the, the place obviously will become... Um, a, um, a leisure or a, a very happy event, a physical event. And um, the notion of the disorder, when it is sweet, it is under certain control, it is under certain order. If it is bitter, the disorder becomes chaos. But if it is carefully careless, then that disorder, it is orderly. So that's basically that was it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alberto. Our second speaker this evening is Phyllis Berkby. Um, Phyllis's first name is Noel. Would you rather be referred to as Noel, Phyllis? Okay. I want to be correct. Uh, Phyllis attended uh, Women's College in Greensboro, North Carolina, Cooper Union in New York, and completed her master's at Yale. She worked with Davis and Brody, 
uh, one of the uh, better firms in New York City from 65 to 1972 as a project designer on uh, many major projects. And since uh, 1972 um, has been uh, in her own private practice. She has taught at uh, City College in New York, the University of Detroit, and the Pratt Institute, which she left to come here to, to teach at SciArc. And this semester, she's teaching uh, in the second year studio. Um, Phyllis? Phyllis Berkby. It's like getting an award. Out. And if you want to use this, if there's a little light here, if you want. Yeah, to use actually, it. I probably won't. Okay. Probably won't even look at that. <laughs> Which one is it? What I was going to do tonight, since this is sort of introduction to new faculty, was uh, just give you a kind of potpourri of some of the things that I've been involved with professionally in my experience. There's uh, one project that uh, I was senior designer on for when I worked for Davis Brody, so it'll be sort of my corporate experience, and uh, a couple of little buildings that I did on my own, and uh, something about one of my pet projects, which was the, the Women's School of Planning and Architecture, which had two sessions, uh, two years in a row. Um, it was an experimental school, but uh, we always thought of that as, a, as another kind of design problem. So I'd like to start out with uh, the building I was intimately involved with of Davis Brody. And get the lights. This, this grew out of a uh, master plan that we developed from a Ford Foundation grant. It's the uh, Long Island University campus in downtown Brooklyn. And the problem there was this, that this was a, um, a campus that was, was not built as a campus. It was uh, built out of um, a collection of buildings in the downtown area that included uh, the Brooklyn Paramount Theater, a, a used car agency, a, a warehouse that was a printing uh, plant as well and various other, you know, clearances. There was a, a, an urban renewal project around it. And our job was to uh, create a master plan converting many of these buildings. Some of them had been converted, and we had to do alterations and other conversions, and to uh, try to solve the problem of how to tie all this together. So this area right in here represents a uh, library learning center. Um, that had to function on a lot of different levels. Um, that was just the basement plan. This was, this was still in the master plan stage. This was uh, an attempt to start knitting together. It was, it was sort of a non-building. It was intended, intended to be um, a fabric and more than a building. It included a library. It had uh, amphitheaters. It had uh, an enclosed uh, theater in here of exhibition spaces off, you know, off the public plaza. Back here was the, uh, the first floor um, of the library. This through here was a street which we could not build on because of utilities and access to a um, transit authority power station in here. So everything had to be bridged. The second level in the master plan um, may show more concretely the uh, concept uh, of this. In actuality, the, uh, what happened finally, you'll see, would be uh, wound up on the third level, but that's minor. This circulation connection, uh, we developed and found ways, and this, this was true, that we could walk all the way from the balcony of the old theater, which is now a gymnasium, in their classrooms up here, all the way through this building across here into this one, across into the new library, and again back into this old printing plant, which was converted um, to a humanities social science center. 
And this was a dormitory that was there before. <clears throat> and each level as we go up is the top of the theater, another connection on the third level to all these buildings. This is the actual connection that was kept because it, it went through all these buildings. Um, and again, as we go up, it just gets more specialized. And we even landscape the roof. Sort of. <clears throat> and this is the, uh, the cross section with the uh, stacks of library back in here, the an audio visual center and computer center, the street, which we couldn't build on, but we could bridge over, and the other buildings in the background, the landscape roof, escalators coming up. What happened uh, was about two years after uh, the development of this master plan, and, some, and this building was converted, this one was converted internally, this one was added on to. Um, there were many, many sort of invisible revisions that uh, up, sort of upgraded the whole urban campus. This building um, lost in part of its program in the process. This whole area in here was knocked out of the program. What we were left with initially was, was a rectangular block, and the decision was made um, to, since we didn't have all the uh, combining fabric, that um, this area uh, that comes in through here and wraps around in between these two buildings was actually the kind of central yard or uh, activity center for the campus, which is a, a com uh, commuter uh, university. Uh, this dormitory uh, is going to get converted again to something else <coughs> eventually. Uh, so it was decided to take that rectangle and just slice it off. And so that this wall would then become the turning and the reflector for this whole yard that would reflect what was back here, back out toward the street and toward the gate as you enter. This was decided to keep all the connections that were still in the master plan or, or in this building. There's a bridge coming from the library to this building. There are internal connections to all these other buildings as well. Um, this is uh, sort of a plan showing the different connections here. And again, the street, which ran underneath. This was the, uh, the basement plan. Here's the street going this way now. And all, all of this under, underneath, down next to the utilities, is all the uh, AV preparation. Mort would appreciate that. Uh, we had dark rooms, photo studios, television studio production, audio production, and all, all kinds of, of facilities of that nature. Um, one of the reasons the building got built was because all of this is being made available to the business community and the educational community and the public in, in downtown Brooklyn. They all use this. Uh, again, on the first floor, we have the street is still there. I have an all-purpose interaction studio theater, which in spite of the shape, which worried a lot of people, has turned out to be quite useful and it's used uh, a lot uh, by both the university and outside people. Um, this is the a lecture center. We have rear screen projections here for this room, this room, and this room as well. This has become a, an exhibit lobby. The second level has a, that's actually now a computer center, and there are ex sort of experimental teaching labs and small studios. The, uh, the university has a two-story edge with these cantilevered balconies from the floor above, which are, um, the handicap has access of two elevators uh, in this case, and then there are these circular stair stairways. The columns are circular against the other square grid uh, geometry. And the top floor, which is uh, mostly offices and uh, the closed stacks and graduate study carrels. And again, the section uh, still remains somewhat similar to the original master plan. Here's the street. We have the theater. 
the library from this level, which here's the bridge here, uh, from that level up becomes the library, and then below are the uh, study rooms, the lecture center, and the AV preparation areas. This is uh, the building under construction. You can see the zigzag of the, of the second level in there, those cantilevered balconies. This is this bridge, which recently won an award. Um, it went to the engineer, though. <laughs> Is a it's a Verendale trust, but it's, it was done. The decision was to make it to express the stresses in, in the in the trust, so that that uh, at this point of support, the stresses are, are closer together here, so that that is expressed in the spacing of those supports. From here to here is a cantilever. This is just sort of touching this building. It's not supported there at all. It is anchored back there um, at the connection to the library. This is it under construction. There's the anchored portion and the cantilevered portion will is about to go on there. <coughs> this is uh, again. I have some construction photographs mixed in with some of the more complete ones. Um, the uh, structural system is an industrial uh, system that actually existed in some of the other buildings. And, and we um, started out with a waffle slab, but uh, wound up using this system that will, uh, was designed for library use. So it's, it's really quite heavy. And with the, uh, the mushroom caps, round columns, flat slab, that slab was about 10 inches thick. These little holes along here is part of the air distribution system for the main reading room. And that's it sheathed. The um, building that this bridge connects with is done in the same brick and uh, similar glass, uh, only the at building is mostly brick and very little glass, and this building is a lot of glass and very little brick. That's just some of the angles that were created by that diagonal and by the bridge going across. That's the inside. <coughs> Can we get a mixture? This is a reflection of the, of the building across the way and mixed in with the transparencies to see the, the balconies inside. It was at one time when we first did, um, like the first design model had a mirrored wall there. And I felt that that was too hostile. <clears throat> Though it did a great job for reflecting the outdoor space out to the street, it didn't give you a clue what was going on inside. And I thought that was really a shame. and and not very hospitable <laughs> for people, you know, to really invite you into, since these were, especially down here, since these are really meant to relate to the community and to the public. This is uh, looking from the theater space out to the street part that runs under the building. This is a construction detail. This is an escalator that, that runs up um, about 27 feet from, from that space up to the library level. <clears throat> this is at the top. This was a, a rounded um, check room, actually, that leads you into the entrance to the library. This was, uh, again, it's some just construction shots of, of the cantilevered slab above, the uh, mushroom columns, the concrete spiral. A longer view of it, and that's it finished. This was a, the other spiral stair that was more toward the inside of the uh, the reading room. That's it finished. That's the view from the top of that one. There was, um, there's a lot of interplay of, of just geometric forms throughout the building. 
This is uh, a study model that we did of the interior <coughs> to see, you know, how we could uh, deal with the bays and the spaces and give a variety of, of seating. There were places where you could, you know, you could lie down, you know, with a book or, or get into real serious study or uh, come out here and study overlooking the balconies. You can, there's, there's a whole, um, like one continuous desk that goes across the balcony so you can sit there and look out if you want to. That's a little close up. And this is what it looks like, or what it looked like before they put all the books in. And the people, there's you know, still no people. <laughs> I mean, it's open now, but these are taken right before uh, the building opened. The columns were uh, painted with a, uh, an epoxy gloss paint, and uh, they were they were polished down first and, and then painted. And <coughs> we wanted them shiny, as uh, uh, contrasted with the um, with the uh, the ceiling, which is uh, like an acoustical paint, and the uh, very simple fluorescent uh, fixtures that that run all the way across. The rug on the fifth floor is bright green, <laughs> and the first floor as well. It's, uh, I think it's the first time Davis Brody broke away from earth tones. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> no. What happened? There's more in there, right? Oh, you got the black. Oh, I see. OK. <clears throat> All right, this was um, uh, uh, a little commission that I, that I did on my own um, for a, a friend of mine who was a sculptor. And actually, this just looks like a little garage. It's the end of a double gable building, and this is this is about to become uh, all skylight across there. And it's it's uh, and it gets barn doors eventually here across here. This, this will get, uh, has now um, plexiglass skylights. And this, this gable here, and there's a flat that goes across, and there's another identical uh, profile on the other side, but it's not skylit. We had to orient the building the long way toward the north with that end. And uh, so that's how we got our, the great north skylight that uh, we both thought was a good idea for him. And uh, that's sort of inside looking back out that way toward the backyard of the house. This was a nice little project because um, he's a skilled craftsman, and uh, the uh, builder was uh, also a skilled craftsman, and there was me. And uh, the three of us just got together, and there were actually no working drawings as such, no formal working drawings done for this building. It was all. I had a set of preliminaries, which were revised uh, right there on the spot, and everything else was phone calls and come on over sort of thing. And we figured it out step by step. At the other, under the other gable, there's a uh, mezzanine <coughs> here. And uh, that just has a, a small sort of um, three by three skylight over it. It was uh, meant to eventually become uh, living quarters for an apprentice. And it's the, yeah, it's the side view of it under construction still. So. This is the happy client. And that, that's one of the shots of the building uh, just after it was completed. There's the, the barn doors in place, and the, all the windows in, the skylight in there, the, the double gable some of his old work. And uh, the interior view, I still don't know if he's insulated it or not. That's it looking down from the mezzanine. These are radiant heaters, which he claims does the job. I mean, this is in Long Island in New York, and it gets cold. Uh, but I think you probably wind up putting insulation in sooner or later. 
this other project, this was a study model for a, um, uh, a house on Long Island out in East Hampton. It was um, designed for solar energy. It actually started out as a cube. Um, there's a, it was set on a diagonal to the view, which you can't see here, it's across the top. The, the house was set with the, with the corners facing into the view. So you could get a good sweep in both directions. It faced over a cliff right onto Gardner's Bay. Um, so you could see on a clear day for miles across the water to the other side of Long Island. Uh, <clears throat> this is a hot water system here. This was a, um, like a Belvedere sort of thing, or to become one. It's a little sketchy here in the model to, to bring the updraft and, the, and to ventilate uh, the house through the stairwell, which was just under here. Uh, eventually, after the hot water system, eventually this whole surface was to become um, covered with collectors. And likewise here, the pool would have its heating system out here. The, the angle, of course, was calculated for that latitude. The other side of the house, again, toward the view, we had butt, butt glass corners uh, in these areas. We had a, a, a guest room down in the basement. We had this living room. We had a, a, a sitting area to the main bedroom, which goes all the way through to here with a balcony off the bedroom over the kitchen. Uh, and these were, this is a guest bedroom and, and another bedroom in the house. It's another view. And uh, I don't know if you can see this, this is um, the plan. This is the part that sticks out. So it's a kitchen with a breakfast area here, again, facing into the view with the butt glass corner in the living room, which is a story and a half high. Um, as you come in, you come in a very high space under a low one, up half a flight to the balcony, which overlooks this out to the view in a guest room, guest bath, sauna, et cetera. The second floor um, has this main bedroom, the sitting area here, the other bedroom, bathroom that goes all the way down under here. There's a laundry here. This is a balcony overlooking the stair. Again, the deck off the bedroom. The trouble with this is that, that it came in almost about $35,000 or $40,000 over the budget for a variety of reasons, one of which was that the contractors in East Hampton took one look at the plans and said, oh my God, a city job, and doubled all their bids. <laughs> so what happened was, essentially keeping the same plan, but without all the, the level uh, interplays, was this. <clears throat> it became a, a cube, <laughs> and with no split levels or anything. And this was redesigned in about a week. Um, but after going through all that, you know, it was just like you do a building once, you sort of know it inside out. And when you get slapped down by the contractors that hard, you just sit down and do the simplest possible thing. And actually, this went back to one of the first, um, the, one of the first uh, sketches, uh, the first design ideas uh, that we had for the house. Anyway, so it was a sort of a, a, a lesson in flights of fancy, I think. Now the entrance is recessed. Uh, nothing pokes out. Uh, and it's just a, um, it's become a cube with uh, organized openings. And you see some of these as we go here, all the operable windows um, are expressed as separate from the fixed openings, which w wouldn't have any casement. This is, of course, without any sheathing on it. I mean, without any siding on This is just the sheeting. <coughs> again, it's just, again, it's just, uh, here's this, the simple cube cut at different levels of the garage underneath. The butt glass corners gave way to a four by four post. <laughs> but we still have a balcony off the bedroom. And that's the house set back from the cliff. And this is 
when I last saw it, it was in this stage where the uh, siding had been put on. Uh, some of the, the fixed glass uh, was in. This part is, is the kitchen part that comes out and the stair will go in here as it comes down from the main bedroom. You can come out in the deck and down the stairs and down <coughs> through the woods and to the beach. <laughs> and that was it. Okay, can we have the other tray? Uh, this, this, the women's school here, is, is the women's school of, of planning and architecture, which is uh, something that, invo that evolved out of uh, a series of conferences, and most of those were held in uh, 74 around the country. There was one in St. Louis, one in Oregon. Um, there's uh, another one on, um, these were women in design or women in architecture conferences. And uh, there was an, a minorities uh, conference in um, Nebraska. <clears throat> and there was a, a collection of about seven uh, architects and planners and journalists who got together at one of these, you know, over a bottle of wine and said, oh, that's our school or our own, you know. And so, <laughs> and, but we were serious. And uh, <laughs> I, th I mean, I think I think we were serious. So there was uh, some of us lived in San Francisco, uh, Boston, um, Detroit, New York, uh, and the seven of us, um, has, you know, spent the next year organizing this event. Uh, we tried to we we uh, was going to be um, and was uh, to a large extent a place where we could experiment with teaching methods. Uh, where we could uh, get away from hierarchies, where we could uh, not try to adapt any, any um, pre-existing structures that we knew of in terms of organization. And uh, we did our best to stay away from preconceptions and, and plan uh, this school uh, without, uh, almost directly from experience as much as possible. This was, uh, these, these first slides are from the first session, which was held in, in Maine in 75. The second session was held in California in Santa Cruz in 76. And uh, in Maine, we chose uh, a place that was sort of uh, neutral in, uh, as far as the built environment goes. It was, uh, uh, the buildings were nondescript. It was a tiny little college. It was isolated out there. But the natural environment was very strong, and that was one of our um, criteria, to, have a, to go to places that had a very strong natural environment and try to find a place with a, a neutral built environment so that we could uh, infuse it with our, with our own energy and, you know, and transform it just uh, from ourselves. And <laughs> this is the daughter of one of the other uh, founders uh, who taught there. All the, all the seven women who started this, all, I mean, we did everything. We did uh, the organizing, the office work, the typing, the teaching, the um, arranging, the, uh, the correspondence. And uh, there was no sort of hierarchy. One person was in charge of seeing that anybody else got anything done. We, pretty much traded off responsibility according to uh, what we like to do or what we could do. And it worked out pretty well. And one of the, one of the things I think that helped work is we had a partnership agreement. And it was a legal document that we all had to sign. And, and that kind of sealed our commitment to seeing, seeing this, this thing go through and to sort of assure each other that nobody was going to flake off or um, anybody wasn't going to pull any power trip on anybody else. And it seemed, it seemed to help, I mean, to have that little legal device. I'm all for contracts these days. These are some of the arrivals. We uh, knew 
if it's to be a, a, a women's institution, it had to have childcare. <clears throat> and we took care of that through uh, a work study uh, arrangement. Uh, all the money to start this thing came out of our pockets uh, for seed money. Uh, and, and we charged tuition to pay those expenses back, to pay the rent on the school and for the food and the facilities. And we uh, were able to give work-study grants to people to do some of the work that we you know, either couldn't handle ourselves or didn't want to. And luckily, we found a group of uh, uh, participants who came who really, who really you know, were into kids, and they turned out to be terrific babysitters. And uh, that was one of the biggest jobs. We did other things like uh, uh, document the courses, uh, both visually and verbally. And uh, I can't think of the others right now. Those are the two, the two biggies. Uh, we decided, in terms of child care, that the, uh, what, what really should be done is to have um, a, a program set for the kids, too, so that, because they all wanted to go to classes with us. And so we thought we'd have to have something going for them other than just a babysitting service. It's one of those realities. The calendar, uh, we had a 20-foot calendar. And these little squares here represent uh, the, the core courses. Each one was given a number. And the scheduling uh, was such that over the two weeks, we had a, each core course had eight sessions. And two of those sessions were uh, scheduled so that Everybody met at once. Therefore, each course had only the people taking that course in it. Um, the four sessions, other than that, were always scheduled so that each of those four sessions were with one of the other courses, so that you could have meetings with uh, two different courses could meet together if you wanted to. And then the remaining two sessions uh, were scheduled so that no other courses were happening at that time. And they were all school. The whole school could come to that course that time. So we had a, a sort of a, a system of different levels of participation. And we didn't have a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule. We had, uh, we, once we set up that system of, you know, two of this, four of that, and two of that, uh, we just arranged it like, uh, like a dance or something, and so sometimes you met twice in a, uh, you know, two days in a row, and sometimes you had two days in between a meeting. And there was, we tried to keep that flexible. We ignored the weekend. We just treated each day as it came, as a single block of time. A lot of these openings got filled eventually because we left a lot of space here, and anybody wanted to uh, schedule a workshop or an event or a field trip, uh, they just posted it there. And they usually happen. So we tried, we tried to keep everything very fluid and, uh, and flexible in that way. This is <clears throat> one of the courses, Professional and Redefined, that was taught by Joan Sprague, uh, who some people might know is, is one, of the, one of the founders of the Open Design Office in, in Cambridge. Here she is doing a parapsychology workshop. <laughs> Here she, in, this was uh, another meeting, was, uh, Joan being much more business-like this time. Uh, and, uh, this, one of the other core courses was the Urban Design, the Outside of Inside. It was taught by Bobby Sue Hood, who is the woman from San Francisco. And uh, they held classes out on the beach often. And this was, this was part of the concept of having a strong natural environment and using it and experimenting with what was around us. And they did a, a lot of their discussion. They were going to, they were doing a study of the place where we were, the campus where we were. And uh, this is how they held their classes. And worked out, um, this is the hand of the goddess giving life to the, to the design. And <clears throat> working out different concepts and problems just out there on the beach. It's very serious business. Uh, but they came back inside uh, to uh, begin to execute drawings and models. This is a community context of town planning. That was taught by Ellen Perry Berkeley, who uh, some of you may know, is a, she was the former senior editor of Architecture Plus 
and our architecture forum. And uh, she, before the, the meeting, just wrote a lot of letters and got all the local newspapers and got women, uh, non-professional women who were involved in different planning issues in the, in the um, whole area and got them to come down and talk to us or arrange so that, that we could go talk to them. And this is just some uh, typical groupings. We had classes out in the driveway. I mean, it happened all over the place. That's actually class. <laughs> That's nice. That, could, that happens here out in the driveway. Demystification of tools. It was one of the thing. One of the things that was recognized that the, um, the woman who taught this has a journeyman's license in, uh, from Germany, and once was the only woman worker in a in a cabinet factory in, in, in Germany had about 300 workers. And so she was delighted to be able to uh, share these skills, finally. And also, it's the first time she ever taught. So again, for even, even uh, the people who ran the school, it was a time of growth and, and experimentation for, for us on a lot of different levels. I don't know if you can see that. And this was part of a whole big board where every, almost every conceivable piece of hardware was put out and labeled so that it was, uh, so everyone could become familiar with it and learn to handle, you know, a whole variety of tools. In, the, in uh, Women in the Built Environment was one, of, was one of the core courses I taught, uh, along with Leslie Wiseman, who we team taught this course. And this, this is just one of the uh, results of a brainstorming session. Uh, I think this was part of figuring out what uh, the school could be, or what we needed to have in it, you know, if it was really to become some kind of institution. This is one of the first things <laughs> they seem to, uh, everything, you know, flying carpets. I mean, it was just very, uh, we tried to freewheel as much as possible to get some of the ideas out. And one of the things we did, which I ha wish I had the film clip for, but I don't, was that we asked them to build a model of uh, some of their thinking. And what we did is provided a table full of uh, party food. and. We had everything from marshmallows to sponge cakes to, you know, licorice drops and toothpicks and vats of colored icing for mortar and uh, things of that sort, you know, with, 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 a, um, with the intention uh, and the idea that play and, uh, is, is a real important uh, design tool or it's, a, it's like a conceptual blockbuster almost, that uh, the element of play uh, has its place in, in design. Um, so we experimented with it and people broke up into teams and they built um, concepts of what the school, how the school might be organized physically with these materials. And uh, what happened was that <laughs> some of them wound up like this. this is a, I mean, we didn't get to them in time with the cameras. <laughs> What happened was that they had a marshmallow fight, and uh, <laughs> and these were given to the childcare people the next morning. But some of them were, I mean, I wish it, right, then the movie would show them, but this is the only slide I have it. There's a scale figure just knocked over there. This was this, the site was a cafeteria tray. And another thing we did was uh, have, uh, we had fantasy projection. Uh, sessions uh, where we got the women to to express what they would really like to have in their environment in whatever uh, way it came out on a fantasy level. <coughs> this is uh, is just one of them. I just include a, a sample of each of these. And we also, you know, <laughs> taught uh, video and uh, had uh, a lot of documentation was done. 
Uh, not all of it successful because it was part of the learning process, but we got the, uh, the porta packs from the school and, and uh, made sure that anybody who wanted to learn this kind of technology uh, got a chance at it. There's a SciArc type there. It's Penny Cosette. This actually was a, a, a mime performance. It's one of, the, one of the things that happened spontaneously. Like in between the courses, people would come up with different uh, skills and things that, uh, you know, to share with each other. We had work sharing. We had a lot of people showing slides of their work and exchanging that kind of thing. And then we also exchanged this kind of skill. At this is um, a, a woman from uh, Denver as an interior designer who is also a mime and she had the, she had everybody doing it uh, that night and these are just toward the end we do, we're just gathering here for a, an old school photograph <laughs> Okay, so that was Maine, and that seemed to work out so well, we decided to have another one. And since that one was on the East Coast, we decided to put this one on the West Coast. And this is uh, this background in here is supposed to be Santa Cruz. And uh, the first poster didn't have any people in it because it never happened before. And this time we had people to put in it. So we have a, a montage uh, put together here with various participants and their children, et cetera. <clears throat> and there's Santa Cruz, and you may know it. Uh, again, <laughs> somebody put up a welcoming sign. And we had, this is uh, arranged the age range, actually uh, went younger than this. But it, was, um, it went from about 18 up to 50, some odd, um, more than 50. This is a, yeah, this is where you seem to eat a lot, <laughs> but uh, I don't even remember why uh, all this was going on. But we are constantly gathering around food. Uh, it seemed to be some for some reason always gathering around food. <laughs> It goes on. Not only did we get fed, but this, this is being brought back. Here's Ina. Here's the uh, milk for the cats. We had, uh, there was a lot made about Julia Morgan, uh, who was the, uh, I guess was more well known around California than uh, back east. Uh, but we found two kittens, and one was Julia and the other was Morgan, and so they became our mascots. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, this is Polly Cooper who came down from Oregon to teach the energy design uh, course, and Kathy Simon from uh, San Francisco who taught a, an architectural design section that combined with with Polly's. And this is uh, Ellen Berkeley who uh, gave a course in writing for designers to <laughs> to teach architects and planners how to put two words together, I guess. And this is Leslie Wiseman, who was my teammate uh, in the Women in the Built Environment section. And that's me. And this is Polly with her, her crowd uh, out on an outing. And <clears throat> Ellen and her group in, the, in their classroom. And this is, uh, we had a very nice studio building that we managed to wheedle away from the university uh, and, and set it up as a studio for the energy uh, conservation in the uh, architectural design uh, studio. This was, this I guess is just a sample of some of the things uh, we did in cognitive mapping as part of, part of the uh, built environment uh, core course. 
And this is some of the things that came out from the, uh, the energy uh, studio. Just different investigations. I mean, it was a two-week session, so it was intensive, and, uh, but also very investigatory and exploratory. You know, we didn't uh, deal too much with trying to get to any uh, like finished product so much. We were very interested in methodology and in process. These are a series of, uh, well, a lot of these, a series of just random shots of, of different, this is, a, this is a, a seminar that was going on. Here's uh, Patty Glazer, who is a, um, she was a Fulbright uh, scholar in weaving. She does architectural tapestry. She's also a student at the Yale School of Architecture now. And she was teaching the, um, architectural tapestry uh, course, which is something that I took. I mean, that was one thing we did the second year that we couldn't do the first year, that everybody who taught something also got to take something, so that we became teachers and students in, in fact. And we also tried to do that within each course. We tried to become as much uh, a participant in the courses as, as the other people, uh, wherever possible. This this was this was uh, interesting to most designers because uh, architectural tapestry is is a, a kind of study in construction and materials, and the limits of materials. And the the looms were simple, but we each uh, had to build them. <laughs> that was our local landscape architect. <laughs> who resented the fact that we didn't have landscape architecture in the title. And this is, this is Marion Haviland from San Francisco who was constantly complaining about being the token black. And the tools, again, we did another tools course and it was slightly different this time. Um, another woman who took it the first year taught it the second year and, uh, and taught um, a taught tools and also um, got people to really learn how to make the different joints. They, were, they didn't really get into making objects like they did the first year. Um, they just really wanted to learn how to make different ways of connecting. <coughs> this was set up in uh, a dressing room off the, off the theater space. And this was two of the participants def demonstrating with some of the joints <laughs> in our work sharing session. Uh, this again, this is a, just a brainstorming session. Uh, this was part of investigating um, uh, self-identity and, and how that affects our prejudices and, and the way we, we see form and the way we react to uh, design issues from, the, from our personal perspective. So a lot, of, a lot of this had to do with the kind of environmental self-portrait that we asked each person to do. I'm in the studio. And this is where Ina Dubnoff got her hair cut. <laughs> This is actually part of the course. We asked each woman to do a, a three-minute video uh, about themselves in relation to their environment, and she chose this time to have her hair cut. This is where we're all doing our body images. This was a field trip. <laughs> they weren't always successful. And we had a couple parties, and I guess this was with this was the uh, the last bash. A lot of people couldn't understand how how a bunch of women could get together and make so much noise, but we did. And we danced. We had all kinds of. We had square dancing, round dancing, jumping up and down dancing. Everybody got in the act. 
Now this, <laughs> this was toward the end, and, and no, it is not some strange kind of orgy. <laughs> what it really is, <laughs> is the building of a support network <laughs> for women in the design professions. The end. Thank you. 